a reading from the book Ave Grazia Plena on painting after postmodernism. It is a sad fact that the theory of art has been corrupting of art. It was an experiment that went badly wrong, one prominent contemporary artist has observed, being asked to understand Derrida just because you can draw, and bad art arises from it. As a practicing artist myself, I write about theory only with ambivalence, stumbling over philosophy's Greek roots and dense Teutonic undergrowth, wandering from one theoretical abstraction to the next in search of something deeper than reason, an artist finds himself lost in a dark wood. If only the eye could see what the soul yearns for, a break in the trees and a vista equal to the vision in the mind's eye, theory might be escaped, yet eye hath not seen, nor ear heard. In theory, there should be no need to put the practice of painting into words, because praxis is prior to theory. No one reads a book to learn how to hit a baseball. When art thrives, theory is an afterthought, amounting to an arid description of what artists are already doing. What do the works of Rembrandt van Rijn owe to the classicizing theories of his French and Italian contemporaries? Nothing at all. Only as old habits and ancient traditions begin to fail, does the theory of art become an indispensable crutch, which is what happened to painting in the early 20th century. Artists became unable to walk without reflecting on their stride. Turning to theory to compensate for ineffectual and rapidly deteriorating skills, modern artists made paintings of painting and art about art as they became acutely self-conscious of what the ancestral craft had been up to all along. The art of painting always was a theoretical game. According to the French theorist Charles-Alphonse de Frenois, a painter's genius resides rather in your eyes than in your hands, as de Frenois writes in De Arte Grafica, on the art of painting, published in 1668. The painter looks, which is exactly what a theorist does, theory deriving from the Greek word for spectator. What is more, the painter looks in the same way and for the same reason as a theorist, to draw reality out of the shell of appearances by reasoning up to pure forms and abstracting out the universal. What a painting depicts is not just a percept, but an idea of what is essential, hence the title of Giovanni Bellori's seminal essay on the theory of art, L'idea del pittore dello scultore e dell'architetto, the idea of the painter, sculptor, and architect, published in 1664. Classical mimesis is no more a transcription of retinal impressions than reading is a recitation of ink blots. Whatever quarrel Plato may have had with the imitative arts, Aristotle naturally detected in the artist handcraft something akin to the craft of thinking, for when the Greeks spoke of art as techne, they did not mean a way of making, but a way of knowing. Painting and theory go together like peas and carrots, or more to the point, like techne and episteme. Be it knowledge of art or of science, to know is to see. Though the fine arts are supposed to address beauty and philosophy truth, John Keats was not wrong to accuse the Greeks of conflating the two in his ode on a Grecian urn. When Aristotle defined the transcendental properties of being as unity, goodness, and truth, he was not disagreeing with Plato, who had spoken instead of the one, the good, and the beautiful, since Plato defined beauty as the appearing of truth. A thing is beautiful insofar as it reveals its ontological reality. For a Platonist, this would mean expressing an ideal form. To an Aristotelian, it means actualizing a being's potential. In any case, to see beauty is to know the truth as something present. Since being is good, the sight of truth always pleases, even when the truth is tragic or painful, as it sometimes is. Its appearing cannot fail to sate the desire to know. Though defined by St. Thomas Aquinas in terms of subjective pleasure as id quod visum placet, that which being seen pleases. Beauty as understood in pre-modern philosophy is as objective as the truth it reveals. But what is truth that one should wish to know it? 
Aquinas defined truth as a correspondence of knowledge with the facts, which also happens to be the common understanding of mimesis, though there is a more essential meaning behind this definition, since there can be no such correspondence unless the facts have shown themselves to be such. The concept of truth undergirding classical mimesis, most conspicuously in the singular significance of the nude, is what the Greeks called aletheia, which literally means unconcealment. The work of art unveils reality. It makes seen what is unseen. Above and beyond the show of dexterity or the transcription of appearances, art is a revelation, ostensibly inspired by the muses, or better still, by God. Michelangelo certainly believed himself no less inspired than a Byzantine iconographer by St. John's spirit of truth, Topinuma tes aletheas. Following Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, the modern artist would speak alternatively of the spirit of the age. Whatever the differences between classical art and modern art, which are obviously vast, it has been argued that in this one respect, art has not changed at all. Is abstraction not beautiful as a revelation of the ontological reality of a painting as paint on a flat plane? Although modern and postmodern art can only rarely be described as beautiful in the conventional sense of the word, it certainly manifests the spirit of the times. Even Hegel, to whom Kandinsky's theory of abstraction was chiefly indebted, recognized art as a presentation of beauty, which Hegel defined as a sensuous manifestation of a free, rational, self-organizing spirit in material form. Hegel understood art as a figurative representation of an ontology, or what is more commonly known as a worldview, and metaphysics as a translation of such figurative representations into rational concepts. Contrary to its reputation, metaphysics is a subject of the most universal interest. The metaphysician asks and answers the question to which the whole corpus of human knowledge and art is a footnote. It all depends on what the meaning of the word is, is, in the infamous words of a former American president. According to Aristotle, to be is the ability to become. According to Plotinus, to be is to be intelligible. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, being is predicated of God, who is ipsum esse, to be itself. According to René Descartes, to be is to think or to be thought. According to Immanuel Kant, to be is to be established outside of thought, as an objective reality. Absent modern philosophy, neither modern science nor modern art would ever have arisen. All men by nature de desire to know, writes Aristotle in the opening line of the metaphysics, but not all metaphysical premises imply the same objects of desire, be it knowledge of ancient Babylonian astrology, medieval theology, or modern physics. What there is to know or paint all depends on the meaning of is. The dubious beauty of modern art expresses a commensurable ontological claim about the nature of reality. But is a painting essentially paint on a flat plane, or is it something else? Martin Heidegger would argue that the work of art is something else. Heidegger recognized an essential difference between art's figurative representation of reality and philosophy's conceptual representation of it. Art as revelation does not simply stand for a worldview, but sets up a world. As Heidegger writes in The Origin of the Work of Art, art opens up a world and keeps it abidingly in force. A world is not an imaginary framework added by our representation, but a way of life. A world is not susceptible of being objectified in theory, but the always non-objectual to which we are subject as long as the paths of birth and death, blessing and curse, keep us transported into being. In lockstep with Hegel's historicism, Heidegger regarded art as a way that truth occurs in history. Truth in the sense of correspondence is certainly ahistorical, 
but truth as unconcealment is something that happens. A world is that happening. A world cannot be true or false in a factual sense, as a worldview can be, though it may be broad or narrow. A world is a road which, with any luck, leads one into the fullness of life. Like a trade route, a world is what makes a society rich or destitute. Consider, for instance, how the medieval world of Christendom was sustained by Christian art. A medieval image of the crucifixion served the propaganda fide, the propagation of the faith, by announcing the kingdom of God, much the way a colossus of Ramses would have announced the kingdom of Ramses, to recite a line from Shelley's Ozymandias. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Yet medieval art was not suffocated by its propagandistic function, and neither was the art of pagan antiquity, because the world which it kept abidingly in force could not exist without it. Art was the author of the ancient world, and subsequently of the Christian world, at least in the sense that Christianity is opened up by biblical stories and sacramental rituals, as well as sacred images. Being a medieval Christian meant living within the historical horizon of Christianity's grand narrative. Take away the art, and the whole world of medieval Christendom would have disappeared. Percy Bysshe Shelley makes precisely this point in the conclusion to a defense of poetry. Poets are the hierophants of an unapprehended inspiration, the mirrors of the gigantic shadows which futurity casts upon the present, the words which express what they understand not, the trumpets which sing to battle and feel not what they inspire, the influence which is moved not but moves. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. In the postmodern world, this is no longer true by all appearances. Art is not world-defining, but defined by an art world. Art is not powerful, but an instrument of regimes of power. Having been aestheticized, commercialized, and politicized by the art industry, the work of art is not a work at all, but a tool subsumed by its function, ranging from aesthetic pleasure to making money to cultural politics. Art's sensuous presentation of the absolute has become a representation of the zeitgeist. Our art is not a revelation, but only a reflection, art's truth having been reduced to a correspondence with the facts of society. As Hegel remarks in his lectures on aesthetics, art no longer counts as the highest way in which truth finds existence for itself. Already in the early 19th century, decades before the craft of painting had betrayed signs of decay, Hegel became the first to speak the grim words that art is dead. Modernity is not a world of art and religion, but of science and technology, an irrationally rational world, which understands truth only as correspondence to the exclusion of revelation. Painting has been made obsolete by photography, not only for reasons of efficiency, but because the productive revelatory labor of artistic representation has been superseded by the passive scientific record of empirical evidence. There remains no transcendent reality beyond the tidy borders of an imminent frame for art to reveal. To a modern world which is not earthbound, but floats in metaphysical outer space, the finite is an all-encompassing horizon of significance, beyond which nothing greater can be thought. Hegel even believed that history had culminated between his temporal lobes, the march of the human spirit into consciousness of itself, having finally attained its end. As the great dramatist of modernity's hubris, Jacques Derrida would remind the metaphysician that representation is never passive. Whatever else a work of art may be, it is the trace of a performance. It is a thing that is made, in the case of an easel painting from vegetable oils and tinted earth smeared across a piece of wood or linen. A painting does not float in outer space, but rests on a literal ground. In the origin, Heidegger draws an opposition between world and earth, analogous to the classical dichotomy 
of nomos and physis, nature and law. The work of art not only sets up a world, but also sets forth earth by making marble glisten, metal shimmer, and earth colors shine. Culture builds upon nature, and in the process discloses nature as nature in opposition to culture. The world set up by art rests on earth, just as the Decalogue was inscribed in stone, while earth rises up through the world as the undisclosed, like the mysterious bronze serpent Moses lifted up in the wilderness. Nature presents itself as the undisclosed by defying reductive explanation, to the point of turning every analytical intrusion into an act of destruction. How does a bronze serpent heal anyone? One might melt it down and subject the medical to chemical analysis, but this will not explain the miraculous. The founding insight of phenomenology is that all phenomenal experience is of a similarly miraculous kind. To analyze what color really is in terms of oscillations of light is only to replace the phenomenon with a vacuous abstraction, utterly powerless to explain color to the blind. Natural phenomena are simply irreducible, though this did not deter Leonardo da Vinci from dissecting cadavers, or Sir Isaac Newton from analyzing light. The sons of Adam and daughters of Eve have no doubt fulfilled God's first command to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Nature's conquest, having produced the health, wealth, and prosperity now enjoyed by the modern world, power is a wonderful thing, and so is knowledge. I, for one, can't get enough of either. The disclosure of what is hidden in the strife of world and earth is the stuff of which truth and, by extension, great art is made. Yet there is a cancerous pathology which grows out of the inordinate acquisition of knowledge, diagnosed by Martin Heidegger in the venerable footsteps of the Apostle Paul and Socrates before him. Professing themselves to be wise, men become fools, as one reads in the Epistle to the Romans, whereas the wisest of men knows that he knows nothing. The vainglorious acquisition of knowledge dulls the sense of wonder at the mystery of being and of gratitude for the givenness of being. As pride comes before a fall, the ground of being begins to give way beneath one's feet as the metaphysician proceeds to conquer reality by defining out of existence everything that cannot be measured and mastered. This dubious species of metaphysics Heidegger pejoratively called ontotheology. Though the name was originally coined by Immanuel Kant to denigrate medieval scholasticism, Heidegger turned the tables by affixing it instead to modern philosophy. By defining away everything that cannot be objectified, the ontotheologian wanders into a logical contradiction. Things which pass in and out of existence, as all things do, are not self-explanatory, because nothing comes from nothing. As Aquinas succinctly deduces in part one of the Summa Theologiae, there would have to be a ground of being whose essence is existence, which is but does not become, and from which all things come. Since the ground of classical theism could not be objectified, it was transformed by modern philosophy first into a deistic god, a being among beings who sets nature in motion, and then into nature itself as the being of beings, sacrificing in both cases the ontological difference between being and beings. The ontotheologian recognizes reality as a property of things, but not estranged from them. Reality is smushed together in ontotheology with the things that populate it into an indistinct compound of supposedly self-actuating potential, as though something might come from nothing. As the ontotheologian strives to disclose the thing in itself in an image made by human hands, whether speaking of modern physics or Vasily Kandinsky's quest to capture the essence of the spiritual in a painting of pure form, he discovers a perfect void, because the essence of things is not only in themselves but in relation to their origin. Structure is not meaning. Meditating on the quantum vacuum of Malievich's black square, Onto theology undergoes a dramatic reversal of polarity. Extreme imminence turns to extreme transcendence. Formalism turns into materialism. The metaphysics of presence becomes a metaphysics of absence. 
and the essentialist an anti-essentialist, otherwise known as a cynical postmodernist. Heidegger regarded ontotheology as a natural and even inevitable pathology of metaphysics. Classical philosophy could no more avoid decaying into modern philosophy than a man might avoid growing old, according to Heidegger, and the same claim has often been made about the decay of classical art into modern art. The alternative to Picasso, Clement Greenberg insisted, is not Michelangelo but Kitsch. No matter how faithfully an academic painter might measure every proportion, or how rigorously a scientist might model the natural world, the essence of things eludes the metaphysician because it resides between the cracks. Think of a dog. What is a dog, in essence? There are several ways by which a thing is classically defined, be it as a bearer of certain characteristics, i.e. substance and accidents, the unity of a sensory manifold, or formed matter. Yet no catalog of parts and effects ever gets to the heart of the matter. What any particular dog is in itself is something utterly irreducible to its material constitution, the sense impression the dog makes, or the traits of its species, just as anyone can imagine oneself transformed like a protagonist of Franz Kafka's into a cockroach without becoming a cockroach in essence. The great limitation of academicism is that the name of reality cannot be forcibly disclosed by the violence of reason. It is not by careful measurement that a painting reveals what things really are, or opens up the being of beings, as Heidegger would put it, but according to a higher rule and more hidden order. An artist, to quote Michelangelo, must have his measuring tools not in the hand but in the eye. In mechanically correct draftsmanship, reality disappears behind one of two extremes. At one end is an idealized truth of things reduced to their species, and at the other end a simple truth of things reduced to appearances, as the French theorist and painter Roger de Peel would explain. The being of beings, or what de Peel would call the perfect truth, is only revealed by allowing truth to happen in the essential strife of the oppositions at play, between the individual and the species, between depth and flatness, between light and dark, between revelation and concealment. The ontotheological reconstitution of art turned this essential strife to dialectical conflict and totalizing synthesis, pure abstraction without individuation, flatness without depth, and darkness without light. In the mold of David and Absalom, the French avant-garde was as much a child of French academicism as a violent rebellion against it. Though the tragic flaw of the ancestral craft, which motivated its self-destruction, goes far deeper than 19th century academicism, the roots of modernism can be traced as far as the aestheticizing premises of the classical tradition and the epistemic attitude of the Renaissance tradition. There is an old quarrel between poetry and philosophy, remarks Socrates in Plato's Republic, on account of art's rhetorical power and its proclivity to deceive. Plato disparaged painting in particular as a soulless imitation of appearances, not one but two steps removed from reality. To answer his own charge of soullessness, it was Plato who instructed artists to reason up to pure forms and Aristotle who instructed artists to abstract out the universal, so that art's power of persuasion might serve truth rather than falsehood. The shortcoming of the classical solution to art's deceitfulness is that it was purely formal. Classical art aestheticized truth, because truth is beautiful, and so is the siren's call, which lures unwary sailors onto the rocks. The classical beauty of the Apollo Belvedere is a truth which in antiquity told a lie, as the propaganda of ancient paganism. The timeless wisdom of Keats' ode on a Grecian urn may be a deep philosophical truth, but it is also the dissimulating cant of false gods. Who but the devil masquerading as an angel of light would claim that beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. As for the Renaissance tradition, the epistemic attitude of modern philosophy was anticipated by Filippo Brunelleschi's invention of linear perspective, two centuries before the ontotheological reconstitution of metaphysics by René Descartes. 
Through the Albertian window, a drama unfolds at a distance, as if on a proscenium stage. We, the onlookers, are not participants in the performance, but stand apart, gazing upon reality in an attitude of disinterested judgment, as if the self were a monadic entity outside the world, and the world inherently delimited by a frame. This is the perspective of a Cartesian subject. Never mind that there is no such point of view from outside the world, because the world is never an object that stands before us and can be looked at. Since linear perspective does suggest the viewer's bodily participation in the world, as well as reality's extension beyond the borders of an imminent frame, Renaissance painting isn't quite Cartesian, but it did open the door. Perhaps only in modern cinema would the Cartesian subject find its pure expression. Once inside the theater, one begins to forget oneself in a beautiful, immersive illusion. The cinematic experience devolves into solipsism as the self disappears. The I, or ego, writes Schopenhauer, is the dark point in consciousness, just as on the retina the precise point of entry of the optic nerve is blind and the eye sees everything except itself. The metaphysical subject is not in the world, writes Ludwig Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, but arises by implication. I know that I am because the world is my world as an object of my thought. In the immortal words of Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. The Cartesian subject constructs being by thinking it into being, there being nothing, either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. By the faculty of judgment, he creates goodness, beauty, and truth as a pagan idolater fashions his god. In a word, the tragic flaw of the ancestral craft was proximate to idolatry. It is not incidental that the first commandment from which not only Heidegger's critique of ontotheology but all criticism ultimately derives would have included an interdiction against graven images. The Mosaic law preempted the problem posed by false images by summarily forbidding them, and in the Republic, Plato would toy with iconoclasm as well. When art is liable to be used by nefarious powers and principalities to inculcate a disordered way of life and a distorted view of reality, the case for iconoclasm is frankly compelling, though this is one solution which an artist would like to avoid. Aside from the wanton destruction of liturgical art during the Protestant Reformation or the occasional bonfire of the vanities, the Judeo-Christian suspicion of images exerted a salutary influence over the development of the ancestral craft by motivating artists to strive all the more earnestly after truth, not only in form but as such. Christianity mitigated the aestheticizing tendencies of the craft, empowering artists to produce works of historical and spiritual seriousness for as long as they did. Only as Christianity's restraining influence over the culture began to wane, did the mosaic tradition of revolutionary critique and iconoclasm become destructive of the craft. As avid participants in the tradition of critique, the modern artist and art critic smelled the idolatrous smoke of fake art all around, and with good reason, in an age of mechanical reproduction. The only fault in Theodore Adorno's withering disparagement of the American culture industry is that it wasn't withering enough. When art does not speak the truth, its illusions are the wool pulled over the world's eyes. Art may present itself merely as an occasion for aesthetic pleasure, but it is never harmless entertainment. Few recognize how deadly serious art is because everyone is blinded by it. No one is more liable to overlook the danger of false images than those most deceived by false images. Like the worlds of ancient Egypt and classical Greece, the postmodern world is a place accustomed to living in a virtual reality, awash in images more real than reality. Everyone knows that there's no accounting for taste, de gustibus non est disputandum. And so you like what you like, and I like what I like, and we all get to live in our own curated reality. A multitude of flavors is concocted to titillate every kind of taste bud, the better to make the medicine go down. And so we swallow a delicious lie, and not just one, but an ocean of them, guzzling deceit as if it were the purest distilled water. 
If only Hollywood could speak the truth, like the words of the prophet Isaiah, who was painted by Michelangelo among the prophets enthroned around the Sistine ceiling. All you that thirst, come to the waters. And you that have no money, make haste, buy and eat. Come ye, buy wine and milk without money, and without any price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which doth not satisfy you? Hearken diligently to me, and eat that which is good. George of Azari, for one, had no doubt as to what constitutes good art, touting the works of Michelangelo as a prophetic revelation and the bread on which every eye should feast. No one would deny the beauty of Michelangelo's art, though not everyone in Vasari's day was so sure about its truthfulness. The Protestant Reformation was all but provoked by the art of Michelangelo, the sale of indulgences for the construction of St. Peter's and the purportedly idolatrous use of images in worship being among the grievances of the reformers. In the aftermath, even the Council of Trent turned a dubious eye on Michelangelo's frescoes in the Sistine Chapel and infamously censored the unseemly nudity of the Last Judgment, though the painting was mercifully deemed sufficiently orthodox to escape destruction. Caught between charges of papist propaganda and pagan erotica, Michelangelo was at once too deviant and too conformist, which is a rather remarkable accomplishment. The essential strife between conservative and revolutionary claims on the truth was not always conflicted. To speak truth to power, like Moses before Pharaoh, is a commendable intention, if ever there was one, and so is the desire to hold fast to the traditions which have been received, held up by the Apostle Paul as the last refuge from the deceptions of Antichrist. To an early Christian speaking truth to the power of Rome through the practice of the sacraments and adherence to the rule of faith, these two aims acted in perfect synchrony. But once those very traditions had become the power of Rome, it was inevitable that the tradition of critique would eventually be turned on itself. As Marx would observe, the revolution began with Martin Luther. The revolutionary spirit of the modern world, born in the Protestant Reformation, used the critical tools inherited from Christianity against Christianity's own apostolic traditions. Thereafter, the harmonious alliance of humanism, classical philosophy, and Catholicism, which had been so complementary for the church fathers and medieval scholastics, no less than Renaissance artists, turned to conflict. Carrying the dialectical conflict to its logical conclusion, in the late 18th century, the American and French revolutions finally produced the fatal polarization of conservative and revolutionary art forms in the 19th century. Unable truly to repeat what had already been said, the tradition promptly turned to kitsch, and the avant-garde could not replace it because nothing really new or wholly other is ever invented. The 19th century artist was fated to exhaust the tradition regardless, whether by fidelity to inherited representations or by challenging them. Although Edouard Manet's Olympia managed to accomplish both, as had the works of Eugène de la Croix, the avant-garde's every attempt to discover the pulsations of a not yet fully conscious vitality latent in the great tradition proved destructive of it. As Charles Baudelaire advised an indignant Manet, chastened by the public's contemptuous reaction to Olympia, he was only the first in the decrepitude of his art. Revolutionary violence is never regenerative. When Gustave Courbet led the charge to topple the Napoleonic column in the Place Vendôme in Paris, the column fell to no avail because the young communards could not invent a new world by violence. The Vendôme column was mercifully raised again, for which Courbet was held personally responsible to the tune of 323,000 francs and driven into exile. As the examples of Moses and Jesus suffice to prove, revolutionary critique is not inherently doomed to fail, though the way is broad which leads to destruction. Good criticism does not simply destroy inherited forms, but redeems them by making old images new. When, for example, Moses raised up a bronze serpent in the wilderness and adorned the Ark of the Covenant with winged cherubim, he transformed otherwise idolatrous images of Egyptian goddesses into a foreshadowing of a true image. The same metamorphosis motivated the design of the subsequent temple in Jerusalem, which, as a microcosm of creation, 
was covered in images of creation, just like an Egyptian temple. Jewish iconoclasm was not absolute because it was messianic. It looked forward to a new image of God and a new exodus when the present state of alienation, slavery, and exile would be healed. Since the meaning of a sign is always another sign, as a good structuralist would say, the false image cannot be made to point at the truth in itself, but it may defer to a true image yet to come. This deferral of meaning toward an horizon of future significance is what Jacques Derrida called messianicity, which is a concept not unrelated to the subject of difference. A critical artist must be inventive in the dual sense played upon by Derrida of making the old image new by opening it up to the incoming of truth in its radical alterity, which breaks open the imminent frame. St. Ignatius of Loyola makes the same point in the presupponendum to the spiritual exercises, that good criticism must redeem the object of its critique. Every good Christian is more ready to save the proposition of another than to condemn it as false. If he is unable to save the proposition, the one who made it should be asked how he understands it, and if he understands it badly, it should be discussed with him with love. If this does not suffice, all appropriate means should be used so that, understanding his proposition rightly, he may save it. When criticism is not redemptive, it is purely destructive, which is why everyone hated Socrates. The gadfly was justly accused, for he was a corrupter of the youth who did not worship the gods of the city, but other daimonia. The modern artists fared no better in the court of public opinion, after 100 years' worth of concerted campaigns to re-educate the unwashed masses and cure them of their philistinism, popular sentiment has evolved, though the public's reflexive judgment of modern art was justified. By mounting a revolution against the academic tradition founded on the precepts of Michelangelo, the modern iconoclast cut off his nose to spite his face. What he desecrated was the work of his own hands. Trapped within an imminent frame of thesis and antithesis, he forswore the duplicitous cunning of his craft and combated a beautiful lie with ugliness, only to tell an ugly lie. Modernism's hunt for pure, simple presence ended in art's pure, simple absence. Carrying modernism's iconoclastic mission to its logical conclusion, postmodern man is now enjoined to castrate himself, dress up in drag, and call himself she. In postmodernity, the patriarchal tyrant has been replaced by a queen, but not defeated. The waters have not parted, and no escape has been made along the wilderness road to freedom. The great and noble Socratic aims of spiritual transcendence and humane critique have been momentously abandoned, not only because of art's integration into the mechanical operation of the late capitalist order, but because art appears unable to do the job in principle. An artist simply does not look from a sufficient distance. Walking the stage, an artist is beholden like an actor to his lines, to inherited representations, which he cannot escape, not even by rejecting them. I have only one language, reflected Jacques Derrida, and it is not my own. The postmodern artist finds himself as ever in the world of appearances, a Venetian carnival of masks and games from which there is no red pill to save him, as Jean Baudrillard might have remarked in response to Hollywood's abuse of his magnum opus, Simulacra and Simulation. Michel Foucault took the critique of ontotheology to mean that reality is simply unknowable, and therefore the struggle for truth amounts to nothing more than a struggle for power. In the opinion of the critical revolutionaries marching in the streets and attacking freedom of thought in the public square, all knowledge is an artificial construction of a Cartesian subject and created to serve the interests of various regimes of power. This conclusion does not follow, though most philosophers would be at pains to explain why. Absurd as the counterfactual claims of the critical mob are, most notably concerning gender and sexuality, even the most obvious facts become unstable when the world in which the facts inhere has melted into air. If critical theory and modern philosophy cannot master reality, how else is one to know it? Before Foucault, Immanuel Kant also claimed that the noumenal, the thing in itself, is entirely unknowable because it lies beyond the limits of reason, 
And the same claim was repeated by Schopenhauer and the early Wittgenstein, speaking of the limits of representation and of language, respectively. As Heidegger dryly observes in The Origin, there are those things which appear like clods of earth and clouds in the sky, and those which hide themselves like the thing in itself or God. Concealment belongs to the essence of truth as unconcealment, just as every negation implies an affirmation, as Aquinas would explain. If truth could rid itself of all that hides, it would no longer be itself. The first principle of being lies beyond being and beyond thought, according to Plotinus. Though beyond univocal intelligibility, the one and the good of Platonic and Neoplatonic metaphysics can still be contemplated, because this does not require its objectification in a conceptual golden calf, but only faith in what is hidden on the strength of what is revealed. The transcendent can be known apophatically by what it is not. Having written his dissertation on John Duns Scotus, who began the ontotheological insistence on univocal intelligibility, Heidegger realized what was obvious to Plato, that reason does not go all the way down. There is no way to force ontological truth to show its face by dint of reason any more than a world can be brought into being by violence. But the truth does make itself known by revelation, as in the bread of presence, which was offered up every Sabbath in the temple in Jerusalem. The greater obstacle is not that the truth hides itself, like the Ark of the Covenant, which was always veiled, but that the truth appears as but one in a semi-infinite array of competing falsehoods, all of whom play upon one's desire to stray into idolatry. The quest for truth is a romance in which the human intellect is the object of seduction. As in every good Victorian novel, truth is discerned by distinguishing the suitor from the seducer. Every baser passion must be subordinated to divine love, what Plato called eros for the divine, which alone illuminates the true object of one's longing, like the menorah which burned continuously in the temple. Although knowledge ordinarily begins in the intellect rather than the will, as Aquinas would argue, knowledge of the first principle of being is no ordinary science. In metaphysics, love precedes truth and is the precondition of it. The love of wisdom is prior to the possession of wisdom, which Socrates did not presume to possess, but only long to behold, as Simeon would in the Gospel of Luke. To see what is unseen, one need only love the truth enough to receive it. Modern philosophy spins in circles in pursuit of truth because it attempts to conquer by violence what can only be known by unconditional surrender to revelation. The mistake of the French avant-garde was one and the same. There is still a reality behind the play of appearances, like a beautiful child hidden in the bulrushes, waiting to be discovered by a daughter of Pharaoh. Reality escapes the violence of modern rationalism because the child is not discovered by those who would kill him. Modernism's maleficent critique has not illuminated reality, and it never will, because reality is what illuminates. After receiving the commandments, the skin of Moses' face shone, and the Israelites were afraid to look upon him. Similarly, in Plato's parable of the cave, the revelation is that the sun is the condition of the possibility of sight. Though one may steal a fleeting glance at the sun, and provided the courage the Israelites could look at Moses, the point is not to stare, but to live by the light. Anyone so foolish as to gaze into the sun simply goes blind. The nihilistic void discovered by the ontotheologian is his own blindness to the transcendental excess of being, the hyperbolic beauty which shines from every created thing, bringing the truth of natural revelation to appearance. As a purported path to enlightenment, Western rationalism, like Eastern mysticism, is the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which leads into exile and death. Promised a wisdom to make one like God, the world has been led astray into an unremitting darkness on which the sun does not rise. The only escape from the nothingness on which the world now meditates is a light sufficient to open the eyes of the blind. Heidegger would call this eye-opening the coming to presence of being, by analogy to the advent of Christ, 
not that Heidegger recognized truth's appearance in Judaism's Messiah, much less Derrida, who spoke alternatively of the coming of the other as the advent of justice, by analogy to the parousia, or second coming. The natural man, writes the Apostle Paul, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Only those born of the Spirit of God might know the things that are freely given to us of God. The truth cannot be mastered, but it may be received as a gift, if one would only have the humility to accept it. If Derrida's colleague and the most distinguished living representative of the phenomenological tradition, Jean-Luc Marion, is to be believed, the best hope of humanity is the very absurdity against which the modern iconoclast rebelled, having less to do with Michelangelo than with what the man painted and sculpted. Talk of religion in the pointedly secular world of contemporary art is greeted with approximately the same paranoia that sex occasioned in Victorian culture, as if God were an embarrassing habit which should be kept to oneself. Sensible of the world in which I am regrettably obliged to live and work and is yet only dimly aware, as a Protestant at the time, of religion's symbiotic relationship to art, I did not set out with the intention of writing about religion. It was in spite of my best efforts to speak the atheistic language of continental philosophy that the subject of God kept returning to the fore in the euphemisms of being and the other. An artist might manage to get away from God, but no one can escape God's haunting absence, least of all in the hellish interiority of modern and postmodern art. Religion, no less than sexuality, is an inextricable aspect of the symbolic, leaving one little choice but to bring the repressed to consciousness, lest it return in the foreboding ghost of a dead father. While I cannot claim the disinterested objectivity of a professed atheist like Camille Paglia, I must agree with her assessment that the route to a renaissance of the American fine arts lies through religion. The foolishness of the great tradition rejected by the modern rationalist is this, that truth is something that happens and has happened already that God himself has walked the stage, revealing himself within an imminent frame, or, as it says in the Gospel of John, that the word by whom and for whom all things were made became flesh and tabernacled among us. When the Apostle Paul brought the good news to Corinth, he came not in loftiness of speech or of wisdom, that their faith might not stand on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. What Paul professed was foolishness to the Greek because it was not a philosophy. It did not rest on the strength of his reasoning or his rhetoric, but on a power antecedent to his words and the signs and wonders performed through him. He simply spoke on the highest authority. Though the appeal to authority is said to be the weakest basis on which to make an argument, God's strength is made perfect in weakness. With little more than a shepherd's staff, Moses led the Israelites up out of Egypt, and by the blood of martyrs, Christianity conquered the Roman Empire. The confidence Paul instilled was not blind faith, but as well-founded as the conviction that thunder is loud and lightning is bright, his own eyes having been opened when he was struck blind on the road to Damascus. Like the paradoxical image of God revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ, fully man and fully God, a true image is an oxymoron. The hope that keeps art alive is the hope of parables and poetic fictions, that lies can speak the truth, that a surface can evoke depth, that by calling reality what it is not, the name of being can be spoken obliquely by analogy. If this hope is without foundation, then art is indeed dead and has never breathed the breath of life. The play of appearances cannot speak the truth unless truth has in fact come to appearance. The paradox would simply be a contradiction had the word not become flesh. If the quest for truth were a power game between equally illegitimate pretenders to a throne which by rights belonged to no one, there could be no reason to make art or write philosophy but to grasp illegitimately for power. Were there no kingdom to proclaim, there could be no just cause to proclaim one. If there were no advent of truth in its radical alterity and no coming to presence of being, the false image could not be redeemed. If art and philosophy do not reveal what is revealed or express the word of God in the words of men, they can amount to nothing but lies. 
If an artist is not inspired like the prophet Isaiah, he is simply a liar and a son of the father of lies. If, as the fathers of Romanticism believed, the artist does not discover reality, but creates his own reality, the artist is a devil, and if so, let him go to hell. If art's only inspiration is a spirit of unreality, its maker is no prophet but a demoniac. Had I no greater inspiration, I would hold my tongue and put down the brush, rather than add one drop to the ocean of deceit in which we swim. Yet I am bold to paint and write, because I have a reason for the hope that is in me. I, like Dante, have seen the face of Beatrice, and I follow her through the Paradiso. Like Dante, I do not write philosophy, but make art instead. If I write about philosophy, I do so only to show that philosophy is foolishness. Art speaks the truth in a way that nothing else can, because it confesses to its deceit in the palpable difference between paint, bronze, or marble, and the flesh. Art reveals what it reveals in the difference between itself and reality. The true image is not ontotheological and does not objectify being by making a vacuous abstraction out of it, as in the pure form of a painting by Kandinsky or Malievich. A true image is incarnate, a bodily union of form and matter, like the beautiful Beatrice encountered by Dante in La Vita Nuova, whose spirit brings Dante to the beatific vision in the Commedia. In Dante's poetry, Beatrice is a figure closely connected to the Blessed Virgin, as are all the noble women of chivalric romance. In Heideggerian language, Beatrice could be accused of embodying the difference between being and beings, even as the mother of God embodies the difference between a father and a son. The light of the Holy Spirit shines through the Virgin like a bush which burns but is not consumed. The same shines through Beatrice as in the face of Moses, because Beatrice represents the bride of Christ. What Dante sees in Beatrice is not herself, but Christ who lives in her. The first time Dante sees Beatrice in La Vita Nuova, is at Mass, which is fitting, because in the Commedia she becomes an image of the body of Christ, bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. Who but the Church leads anyone to God? Christ never explicitly appears in the Divine Comedy, because he does not need to appear. Dante does not need to disclose the vision of God directly, as if that were possible, but is only to reveal what is revealed, one step removed from reality. The face that moves me, as Dante was moved, can be seen by anyone in the masterpieces of the great tradition, the greatest examples of which were created to adorn the church. If the drawing of Michelangelo and the color of Titian cannot open the eyes of the blind or turn one's eyes toward the vision of God, it is doubtful that anything ever will. The appropriate response to this cultural patrimony is no hermeneutic of suspicion but love, by which light alone the eye ever truly sees. One may, on occasion, have cause to renounce the riches of the archetypal father for love of another, as St. Francis did before the Bishop of Assisi, though the modern artist's renunciation of craftsmanship bears little resemblance to the actions of a saint. Craftsmanship means more than a bravura performance, because it stands for more than itself. A thing of fine craftsmanship is a symbolon, from which the word symbol derives, a throwing together which no man should put asunder. A literal symbolon might consist of a bone or a potsherd broken in half as a symbol of a contract, a bond of friendship, or even matrimony. The symbolon would not only stand for such a bond, but substantiate it indissolubly. Everything that partakes of the symbolic serves the same purpose, to bind a body together as does the Eucharist, in a new creation. It is often objected that the Eucharist is not just a symbol in virtue of the real presence, when in fact the Eucharist is the quintessential symbol in virtue of the real presence. As a symbol, a poetic figure is vested with a power belied by the futility of the thing itself. Symbols are historically contingent, if not purely arbitrary, and composed of inanimate, if not always worthless, materials. Yet there is an invisible potency in this materiality, without which the symbol would not even exist. Only in the union of form and matter 
as in the elements and words of the sacrament, does the work of art symbolically heal what Hegel would call the conflicts and oppositions which rend the self and the world to pieces. What the modern artist did in the name of pure form represented a diabolical throwing apart of every tie that binds in the impious mold of the French revolutionaries who decapitated the Bourbon state and of the Protestant reformers centuries before who had torn apart the body of Christ, which I have the right to say both as a former Protestant aggrieved by the alienation from sacred tradition that I inherited and as an artist aggrieved by the destruction of the ancestral craft of painting. Supposing that the brokenness of the modern world might be healed, the craft can be received once again like a bride in a spirit of gratitude. Artists do not have to be heretics who pick and choose their own truth by vain reasoning, but might instead surrender to the truth made manifest in the signs and wonders of every master of the craft whose painted words evince an authority which commands belief. This is not to idealize the tradition, as the craft may well be barren. The only way to find out is to take a leap of faith, for better and for worse, in sickness and in health, by learning the craft and discovering for oneself whether the art of painting can be made new. A proper attitude is neither skeptical nor ironic, but affirmative, empowering the tradition to critique itself on the presumption that it contains within itself the means of its own renewal. The revelation of what is unseen need only be balanced against its evocative concealment, as in the play of lost and found edges. This balance is already characteristic of Renaissance art painted in chiaroscuro. The Albertian window, clouded by Leonardo's fumato, is not a pure presence, but like the glass of which St. Paul spoke, through which one looks darkly. Implicit in every work of Renaissance art is a metaphysics of presence and absence of imminence and transcendence, arrayed in a dynamic hierarchical movement. Absence is actually the privileged term, though it would appear otherwise, because the transcendent condescends to the material world in order to uplift it, even as God condescended to become a man. The craft would never have been elevated to the status of a liberal art otherwise, had the liberal artist not condescended to become a craftsman like St. Joseph. Omnis ars naturae imitatio est. All art is an imitation of nature, and not only of how nature looks, but especially of what nature does as a metaphorical mother. The patron saint of painters, St. Luke, is traditionally depicted painting the virgin and child, because the art of painting is modeled after a woman full of grace who bore the veritable image of God. The craftsman, the craft, and the work of art comprise an image of the Holy Family. So long as art continues to be prostituted to the spirit of the times, which is the spirit of Antichrist, every attempt at renewal will end abortively. But if it can only be wedded to the spirit of truth, the surface of the canvas may once again become an horizon in which truth comes to appearance in a labor of love. The title of this book is taken from the opening words of the Annunciation to announce that the art of painting will bear a timeless and eternal truth again. I speak of the artist as a man by analogy to St. Joseph and defer to the masculine pronoun, not to imply that women shouldn't be artists, but because the patriarchal construction must be sustained and affirmed, according to Derrida, in order to deconstruct itself. The deconstruction of hierarchical distinctions between presence and absence, speech and writing, signified and signifier, or male and female, is a worthy cause as old as the Council of Nicaea, though the point is not to invert the hierarchy, much less to dissolve the binary opposition which creates sense. As illustrated by Christianity, the economy of authority is sustained and affirmed in order to ascend it. By humbling himself and submitting to God's will, just as God humbled himself by becoming a man, man is lifted into union with God, resolving the hierarchical difference between them without erasing it. The one who humbles himself is exalted. The natural hierarchy is superseded by the economy of grace, whereby the first shall be last and the last first. Is the Virgin Mary not greater in the kingdom of heaven than Joseph? Yet the radicalism of Christianity has fallen on deaf ears, including Derrida's own, 
because no one wants to hear that the most revolutionary thing anyone can do is to live always in tradition, to quote Leon Trotsky. The truth is a paradox, and love is the absolute, which moves the sun and the other stars, as Dante concludes the Commedia. Art's sensuous presentation of the absolute is an expression of love, rightly ordered toward being, toward the one, the good, and the beautiful, the purpose of which is to direct man toward his highest and ultimate end in contemplation of the divine essence. Art is a foretaste of eternal beatitude. Art which serves any other end expresses a disordered love of the deficit of being, otherwise known as evil. There is nothing else that an artist needs to know but to do good and not evil. Obey the natural law. Like the doctrine of the Trinity, there is a simplicity to good theory, even as it opens onto unfathomable depths. Whatever the merits of Freudian psychoanalysis, Marxian historical materialism, Saussurian structuralism, and Derridian post-structuralism, the theory of art has gone opaque under their influence. The thrust of contemporary theory is merely to confirm what everyone already knows, that art is dead, and to ensure that it stays that way. To make art of spiritual and historical seriousness has become impossible in postmodernity. Art is now treated not like the mother and bride that she once was, but a whore, debased by its total commercialization and deprived of its truth-bearing function by its aesthetic objectification. Meanwhile, the artist has become something less than an artisan, not even a cornichaio, but merely a metaphorical framer. There being nothing of great importance for art to say and no direction in which to progress, artistic practice has become solipsistic. As Arthur Danto wrote in 1986 with a nod to Hegel, all there is at the end is theory, art having finally become vaporized in a dazzle of pure thought about itself and remaining, as it were, solely as the object of its own theoretical consciousness. Some decades later, the vaporization of which Danto spoke has now begun to precipitate. Artists have thrown up their hands in despair of understanding Derrida's De la Grammatologie, and art has passed from the post-historical to the post-theoretical, a development which Martin Heidegger, for one, might very well have celebrated, if not Derrida himself. As Heidegger argues in the afterword to the origin of the work of art, the end of art is the handiwork of bad theory and a catastrophe to be laid at the feet of the Enlightenment, which emptied art of its truth-bearing function. Heidegger defined his own philosophical project in opposition to Hegel's. The imperialism of reason which Hegel had meant to consummate, Heidegger sought to overcome. It was for the better in Hegel's view, but for the worse in Heidegger's, that art should be aestheticized and reduced to an occasion of sensuous pleasure. Where Hegel had celebrated the passing of art's nobler purposes as a sign of progress, Heidegger awaited art's return like the coming of a messiah, as a decisive confrontation with the destitution of the age and that which we need more than anything else. I am inclined to agree. Heidegger shared Hegel's opinion that truly great art is a relic of antiquity in the late Middle Ages. Everything that has been created since the Renaissance is something less than great, and in Heidegger's opinion, much less, greatness being a function not only of a work's quality, but also of its reception. A medieval cathedral was a place people went to be in the presence of God in the Eucharist. Its beauty was not an object of disinterested pleasure, but an occasion of authentic spiritual transcendence. The stained glass windows, vaulted ceilings, and flying buttresses of Notre Dame de Paris were not for public entertainment, but to the glory of God. Its construction was an event of world historical significance as the beating heart of a whole society who invested their wealth, their labor, and their ingenuity in its creation. Quoting from Hegel's lectures on aesthetics, Heidegger asserts that art is and remains with regard to its highest vocation, a thing of the past. The loss of fine craftsmanship being merely symptomatic of art's death, the recovery of fine craftsmanship cannot by itself bring great art back any more than the restoration of Notre Dame will make that cathedral what it once was. World withdrawal and world decay can never be reversed. The works of times past are no longer what they were. The works themselves, it is true, are what we encounter. Yet they themselves are what has been. 
as what has been they confront us within the realm of tradition and conservation. Henceforth, they remain nothing but objects of this kind. Their former self-sufficiency has deserted them. The whole of the art industry, even if taken to extremes and with everything carried out for the sake of the works themselves, reaches only as far as the object being of the works. By Heidegger's criterion, the conditions for great art simply do not exist anymore. Hegel believed the lost innocence of the modern world beyond recovery, the eclipse of art and religion by science and technology, being a natural stage of development in the maturation of the human spirit, and no more to be mourned than the loss of childhood. Heidegger regarded this belief as presumptuous, as do I. History follows no law. The character and timing of world historical change, writes Heidegger, can be neither predicted nor controlled. Nor is it necessary that we know. A knowledge of this kind would be most ruinous for man, because his essence is to be the one who waits, who attends upon the coming to presence of being. As one awaiting the parousia, I couldn't agree more. The solution is very simple, because good theory is always simple. An artist must wait upon art's return by preparing for art's return. The way to prepare, in obedience to the natural law, is by refusing to aestheticize, commercialize, and politicize one's own artistic practice. Do not serve pleasure, money, or power, otherwise known as the flesh, the world, and the devil, but make art of great matter and commensurable form. Matter matters, and so does good form, by the principle of the integral good. The form of great art seduces the eye, not for pleasure's sake, as if hedonism were the meaning of life, but to adorn the truth. Great art pleases in order to instruct. It serves human happiness, as Plato would explain, by teaching one to love what is truly beautiful. Great art does not arouse antecedent passions, but cultivates virtue by guiding the intellect and the will into contemplation of the divine essence. It is ironic to reflect that the cause of the great tradition over and against the postmodern world would be so well supported by a precursor of deconstruction like Heidegger, much less Derrida himself. Can it be that the solution to the enervating influence of postmodern philosophy is postmodern philosophy? I can hardly believe it either, but yes. One must redeem the proposition of the other. The seeds of the word, like the Athenian altar to an unknown god of which the Apostle Paul spoke on Mars Hill, are always already present, even in postmodernism. The paganism of classical art was not insurmountable to artists of the Renaissance who transformed pagan myths into Christian allegories because all things become gospel in the light of the gospel, to quote Origen of Alexandria. Artists and philosophers with no inkling of the truth have often spoken the truth unawares like Caiaphas. Inspiration is surprisingly commonplace. What Heidegger and Derrida had to say, their atheism notwithstanding, is very nearly what artists need to hear, and so with much bemusement I have written something suspiciously like a ponderous tome on deconstruction, praying that it may be the last. The misreading of Derrida, which has been circulating among artists and in academia for the past 40 years, must not be swept under a rug and forgotten, only to continue to stink up the place, but find its way down the toilet where it belongs. Of course, it is no wonder that Derrida should be the victim of misreading. For what does the name Derrida stand but the way that words go astray? The meaning of words, so Derrida tells us, cannot be fixed by an author's intention, nor can they be anchored once and for all in reference to anything in the world, because language doesn't work this way. Language is a vessel for disseminating, moving, and shifting meaning, much the way a chalice does with wine. Like any cup, it is liable to lose its contents. The art world's luminaries have in effect drained the tankard and then proceeded to urinate in it, which was perhaps to be expected of people who put urinals on display in museums. On Derrida's authority, we artists have been told that there is no transcendent reality for art to disclose and that every historically contingent practice is a purely arbitrary manifestation of the same meaninglessness. We have been told not to trouble ourselves about aesthetic judgment, there being no basis of judgment in a world with no foundations, no essences, no purposes, no structures, and no stories. Our institutions of high culture have decided that anything can be art and put excrement on display to prove it, both literally and metaphorically speaking. Rather than teach us to see, the postmodern world informs us that we are blind, and so we may as well paint with our eyes closed. This is obviously difficult to swallow. 
The title of the standard textbook on critical theory for artists, Frederick Jameson's Postmodernism or The Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, says it all. What is gone by the name of postmodernism is simply the relativistic ethic and nihilistic ontology implicit in advanced capitalism. As Derrida insisted in response to the straw men set aflame by his detractors, this way of thinking context known as deconstruction does not, as such, amount to a relativism with everything that is sometimes associated with it, skepticism, empiricism, even nihilism. First of all, because as Husserl has shown better than anyone else, Relativism, like all its derivatives, remains a philosophical position in contradiction with itself. Ignoring Derrida's protestations, the left has conspired with the right in an act of egregious misrepresentation. The avant-garde artist has made Derrida mean what she wants him to mean, which happens to be exactly what the reactionary polemicizes. The former a nihilist who pretends that nihilism is benign, the latter a nihilist in denial of his nihilism. Together, they have waged two parallel propaganda campaigns, spreading the same misinformation for opposite reasons, a dynamic uncannily reminiscent of the Cold War. Marx and Derrida would appear to have something in common after all. It is the nature of the postmodern condition that nothing means what it means, including postmodernity itself. Postmodernity is just modernity, now gloriously unencumbered by eschatological hopes be it in socialism or the second coming of Christ. Ours is a world without meta-narrative, a worldless world, as defined by Jean-François Lyotard in 1979. The grand narrative of modernity is at an end because the eschaton has already arrived through the triumph of capitalism and liberal democracy. The truth is here and now. Postmodernity has been styled the end of history, the end of art, the end of philosophy by the likes of Francis Fukuyama on the theory that the neoliberal order is the closest approximation to the arrival of heaven on earth that can or will be built by humanity, a brave new world of carnal delights not unlike the one foretold by Aldous Huxley. The grand narrative of modernity is a story about the historical fatedness of a certain kind of personal freedom. Like the gospel, modernity is modeled on the story of Exodus as an ascent of the individual out of slavery in Egypt into the promised land, from out of the shadows of subordination and marginality into the light of full recognition, dignity, and autonomy. The good news of the modern world is the gospel according to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who preached that the self is our Lord and Savior and the autonomous individual our only rightful king. A truly postmodern philosophy is one which, having fully absorbed this great narrative, assumes an ironic distance from it and undertakes to appropriate and critique the story. It is in this sense that Heidegger and Derrida, as well as the later Wittgenstein, might be called postmodern. Postmodern art is postmodern in a different sense, of the day after the conquest. Having apparently arrived at its destination, postmodern culture basks in the freedom of a land flowing with milk and honey, with faux naive devotion to the conquests of the avant garde, as if there were nothing amiss in modernity's great liberation of the individual, which has alienated the self from the service of anything greater than itself. Where the ancient idolater mistook dubious spirits for God, an entirely understandable case of mistaken identity, the modernist mistook himself for God, which is not only depraved, but absurd. If Jean-Paul Sartre is supposed to have been the self-cause cause, it is strange that he had no recollection of creating himself, much less the world. In truth, modern and postmodern man is no God at all, but a slave oppressed by the very worst of masters, in bondage to self, as Jean-Luc Marion has remarked. It was only as I came to understand this that the perplexing condition of art became self-explanatory. I remember even as a child of five or six being so incredulous at the things I saw in art museums that I was convinced my elders had lost their minds. It was like being told that one plus one equals three because self-important people in powerful institutions say so. As I grew up, I discovered that this want of judgment is only typical of a society governed and populated by Sartrean existentialists who feel entitled to make up their own reality. These days are like those when there was no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes, except that the kingdom has already come. We have been shown the way, but no one wants to follow it. We have been told the truth, but no one wants to hear it. We have been given life, but no one wants to receive it. 
The condemnation is this, that light has come into the world, and men have loved darkness rather than the light, because their deeds are evil. Sin darkens the intellect, to quote St. Thomas Aquinas, which is a delicate way of saying that a degenerate way of life makes people stupid. The stultification of the culture corresponds to our degeneracy. The culture industry feeds only the basest appetites because we have neither the intellect nor the will to eat what is good. Truth is stranger even than Kafka's fiction, for we have in essence become a species of insect. We used to know what it means to be human long, long ago, but after so many centuries in flight from our former metaphysical commitments, modernism has fatally corrupted our collective judgment. Art is dead because we are dead inside. If the end of modernism's meta-narrative is the end of art, the return of art can only mean the return of the biblical meta-narrative. Artists must become the unacknowledged legislators of a future Christendom by repenting of modernism and painting a divine revelation. In the Gospel of John, Christ explains how an artist might receive inspiration. To know the things that are freely given by the spirit of truth, one is only to love the truth, enough to surrender to it. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. To quote the penultimate words of the Apocalypse, Come, Lord Jesus. Postmodernity may well be the end of history, and I earnestly pray that it is. Though for the sake of the world, and especially of the United States, which even now teeters on a precipice, I also pray that it is not. The only way to practice the ancestral craft authentically is on one's knees, like Fra Angelico, kneeling with the Blessed Virgin before the throne of judgment and begging God's mercy on behalf of a fallen world. The seductive deceptions to which modern society has fallen victim are no cause for anger, but only sorrow. The contemporary culture is only what one might expect from a people who have suffered a spiritual death and cannot remember what it is like to be alive. One must not judge but weep for every soul who does not have the life that is in Christ. The fateful hour when an artist can paint no more and all intercession must cease is an hour to be anticipated with fear and trembling. Martin Heidegger famously remarked in an interview with Der Spiegel shortly before his death, nur noch ein Gott kann uns retten. Only a God can save us. Speaking of the imminent threat posed by nuclear war, it grieves me to say that he was mistaken, for without repentance, not even God can save us. Solomon laments in Ecclesiastes that in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. I have my doubts that a great restoration of the arts, much less the art of painting, is on the horizon, because I know very well that in the end of history, the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, as John writes of the metaphorical Babylon. Nevertheless, I write as though Christian civilization had a future to look forward to, even as the last nail is being driven into the cross on which it hangs, because I also know that faith is known to move mountains. Amen, I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove from hence hither, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you.